The topic that I have is a pretty common one, but I want to speak about it from a very specific perspective. How many of you have heard of the incident of Ta'if with the Prophet Okay. How many of you have heard the dua of Ta'if? Very famous dua. Allahumma ilayka ashku ba'fa quwwati. And so on. Well, I complain to you of my weakness, my inability. You've all heard that dua, right? Famously translated, uh, relayed narration through the books, though it's not documented with the scrutiny of a hadith, but very famous uh, transmission of the sentiment of the Prophet ﷺ in that moment of ta'if. But I want you to think about the du'as that you've never heard. Sayyidina ibn Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the only person with the Prophet ﷺ on that journey of ta'if that witnessed him walking, covered in blood, with pebbles in his shoes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what hurts more is the rejection. More than the stones to the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the punches, the blood, were the wounds that were caused to his heart, alayhi salatu wa salam. And Allah mentions that it hurts you what they say. This is the culmination, ta'if comes after a lot of heartbreak. Ta'if comes after the death of the people that would console him, Am al huzn It's called the year of grief. The year of grief is when he lost Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and he lost Abu Talib. It compounded the hurt that is yielded on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over time. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha did not witness the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after Ta'if. She saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after Uhud where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from a physical perspective, was wounded heavier than he was in Ta'if. Physically, the Prophet ﷺ almost died in Uhud. His teeth were knocked out, alayhi salatu wasalam. He had blood running down his face. He was carried on the shoulders of his companions, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And she thought that was the worst day of his life, but instead the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that that was the worst day of his life. It was Ta'if. When the people degraded him, mocked him, humiliated him, and he is left to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now, subhanAllah, I think to myself, how amazing is it? We actually don't have a single narration about what the Prophet ﷺ was saying throughout the night as he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He prayed all night after Ta'af sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can you imagine the sincerity and the depth of those words that were never narrated to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was hearing? Allah who is more merciful to his creation than a mother to her child, hearing the most beloved of his creation to him cry out to him in his lowest moment. Think about where the dua of the Prophet is reaching in those moments. Think about how that dua is probably shaking the heavens and none of us heard it. It's not documented in the books, but it's documented with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Battle of Badr, the night before Badr, you know, one of my, my favorite places to actually visit is Badr. It's not like Uhud, which is very close to the Masjid of the Prophet Wasallam. It's about an hour and a half out of Medina. It's very tranquil. It is, uh, the battlefield is intact. And so you can see exactly how it plays out in front of you. There's no streets cutting in between. You can see where the wells of Badr were, still carved out. You can see where the enemy came from. It's all there. Masjid al-Arish, the masjid of the tent where the Prophet ﷺ was camped out. The tent of the Prophet ﷺ was right there. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that the Prophet ﷺ spent the entire night before Badr in dua. Think about that. The night before Badr, the Prophet ﷺ was supplicating the entire night. Now all we have from that dua is the end of it. And it's when the Prophet ﷺ sees Quraysh coming. So he's been praying the whole night, right? I mean, this is a very scary time. This is the first time that the Muslims are going to come face to face with Quraysh, heavily armed, outnumbering them with bad intentions. Their intention is to wipe out the Muslims once and for all, to kill the Prophet ﷺ and to kill each and every single one of his companions 
and it seems like a sure shot when they're coming. So Islam was meant to end right there in that battlefield of Badr. There weren't Muslims around the world that would carry on Islam. That was the only isaba, the only group of people upon La ilaha illallah. Can you imagine all of the people of La ilaha illallah in one part of the earth? That's stunning, right? They're all there and the Prophet ﷺ is with them. And Ibn Abbas narrates the moment when the Prophet ﷺ sees Quraysh coming with their arrogance, with their sense of triumph before the battle even starts. And the Prophet ﷺ raises his hands to the sky. And he raises his hands so high that the garment that is on his shoulder وسلم, falls. His garment falls and he says, Allahumma nasruka alladhi wa'attani. Oh Allah, the victory that you promised me. Allahumma anjizli ma wa'attani. Oh Allah, fulfill to me what you promised to me. Oh Allah, in tuhlik hadhi al-isaba, if this group of people is killed, la tu'bad fil ard. You're not going to be worshipped on the earth after today. You won't be worshipped on this earth, oh Allah, if this group of people is killed. And as he's doing that Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu picks up his burd, his garment, his shawl, and he puts it around his shoulder. He says, Hasbuka ya Nabi Allah. Enough, O Messenger of Allah. Your Lord will give you what he promised you. And the Prophet Sallallahu puts it back on and he recites, Sayyuhuzamu al-Jam'u wa yuwalluna dubur. That they will be defeated and they will turn back on their heels. Their animals, and everything they came with will turn back in the direction of Mecca that they came from with such confidence. Almost to where the naked eye would see it as a contradiction. If you looked at the Prophet ﷺ at that moment, you might think that maybe there's doubt. There was no doubt. But the naked eye might look at him and say, the way he's making dua right now looks like a person who is very desperate who's in doubt, the words that he's saying seem to indicate a fear in his words. And this is very powerful because the ulama, the scholars say, the Prophet was making dua throughout the entire night. We don't know those duas. We haven't heard them. They say that that part of his dua, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was actually a teaching moment for the companions about how to make dua like a miskeen, like a person who is destitute, like a person who is completely in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want a dua of masakeen, the dua, the supplication of the poor and the oppressed? Look at the Prophet of Allah, a man who receives divine revelation, and look how he pleads with his Lord. And that was the moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ when you called out to your Lord, you pleaded with your Lord and Allah answered you. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the malaika in the thousands. The thousands of angels came down from the skies, from the heavens to support the Prophet sallallahu and his army. So it was a teaching moment to the companions of the Prophet of Allah. That is what the ayah indicates. Am hasibatum an tadkhulul jannah. Do you think that you will enter into paradise? وَلَمَّا يَأْتِكُمْ مَثُلُ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ And then you hear about those that came before you. مَسَّتُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَالضَّرَّاءُ وَزُلْزِلُوا They were struck with hardship. الْبَأْسَاءُ uh, The ulama say here means الْفَقْرِ Poverty. وَالضَّرَّاءُ Hardship. أي الْأَمْرَاءُ Sickness. All sorts of sicknesses break out amongst them. وَزُلْزِلُوا And they were shook. What is that referring to? Fear and anxiety. So they're struck in their material means, they're struck in their physical bodies, and they are struck in what? With their anxiety. They're struck with their fear. Until Hatta Yaqulu Rasulu Waladina Amanu Ma'ah, until the Messenger of Allah and those that believed with him said, Mata Nasrullah. When is the help of Allah coming? The help of Allah is close to you. It is near. Now, mata nasrullah, as a scholar say, when is the help of Allah? Could be a form of praiseworthy dua, 
or a form of hated questioning. When the Prophet says it, it is not questioning Allah's ability. It is reaffirming that Nasrullahi Qareeb, that the help of Allah is near. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when. It is not a question of Allah's capability. It's a question of, have we done enough to deserve His help just yet? Have we done our part to qualify for the Nasr of Allah, to qualify for the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? SubhanAllah, if I'm a companion at Badr watching the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? But what did it do? It immediately translated into the angels coming down from the heavens in a way that even the companions could see. So it gave them a form of thabat, a form of firmness. And they realized the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was teaching them about what it's like to plead to Allah in desperation. We will one day see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam make dua. We will one day see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam make dua. Can anyone tell me when? The day of judgment. When the people have been gathered, the first of them and the last of them, the human of them and the jinn of them, every single human being that has walked the face of the earth from Adam alayhi salam until the last person on this earth gathered in al ard al-Mahshar, in the place of assembly. What an awesome sight. Awesome not in the sense that it is something that we would look forward to, but awesome in that it inspires a sense of awe and the greatness of Allah over His creation. All flat earth, one plain white land, no landmarks, no signposts, no distinguishing features to any human being except for those who Allah has praised. And you look to the angels, and how are the angels described? Safan Safa la yatakallamun. Amazing. Jibreel alayhi salam, Mikael alayhi salam, Israfil alayhi salam. The angels lined up in rows and they don't speak. Everyone is looking for something to initiate the day of judgment. And the, the words of the prophets and everyone that day is what? Nafsi, nafsi. Everyone's worried about themselves. And the people start going to the prophets of Allah. Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam. They go to these prophets of Allah asking for intercession until they come to the Prophet sallallahu And the Prophet sallallahu says, Ana laha, it is for me. And he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I will ask permission to enter upon my Lord and I will enter and I'll fall in sajda, prostration. The entirety of mankind is watching the Prophet of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want to see your lips move when I say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The entirety of the creation is watching this man alayhi salatu wa salam and placing its hopes in him. And he enters into the presence of his Lord in sajda. And what does he say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It's really powerful. He says that Allah will inspire in me al-mahamid, husn al Words of praise, words of glory, Lam yuftah ala ahadin qabli. Words that will be inspired to me that have never been inspired to anyone before me. Meaning, there's a dua that I'm going to make there that even I don't know yet. SubhanAllah, think about that. Even the Prophet of Allah SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam is not sure yet what that dua is actually going to be. But Allah gave Adam Islam the words. When Adam Islam fell from the heavens, Allah فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتِ Look how merciful Allah is. Allah gave him the words to seek forgiveness with. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And that's when he called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Oh Allah, we wronged ourselves. فَإِنْ لَمْ تَخْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَا مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ If you don't forgive us and have mercy upon us, then we're going to be from the losers. Allah gave him those words. Words of repentance and here, the greatest son of Adam alayhi salam and the entirety of the children of Adam depending on this dua and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi doesn't know what he's going to say yet. But he knows that Allah will give him words to say. 
that will initiate the entirety of the Day of Judgment. Allah will tell him, raise your head, O Prophet of Allah, ask and you will be given, intercede and your intercession will be accepted. SubhanAllah, what an awesome sight. May Allah allow us to be amongst those standing behind our Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam on that day. Allahumma ameen. May Allah grant us that shafa'a, that special intercession of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam on that day. Allahumma ameen. But those words, we won't know. Even he does not know Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're those words that you say to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with the utmost sincerity. And the most beloved of your du'as to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala are those supplications that are made completely affirming his perfection and affirming your own brokenness before him. It's the du'a of Ayyub Alayhi Salam. Ya Rabb, masani ya I'm struck. I'm struck by hardship. Wa anta arhamur rahimin. And you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. The ulama say, Subhanallah, Ayyub alayhi salam, he minimized his pain, he maximized the mercy of Allah, even after 18 years of living under horrific torture. Okay? Subhanallah, all of that time, and he calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, I've been struck by a hardship. Some harm. And you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. And Allah opens up the doors for Ayyub alayhi salam in ways that he has never seen before. The topic is how do you see light in times of great darkness? How do you find hope in times of great despair? And for many of us, when we think about the light, at the end of the tunnel, we spend so much time trying to find the light at the end of the tunnel that we forget to focus on the one who gives light, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the point of getting through hardship is not that you can rationalize a way out. Sometimes when you're going through something individually, the only time you find some peace or contentment is when you can actually think of the way out. You actually can think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you afterwards and you can see a path forward and that's when you start to feel goodness. Not realizing that the point is to focus on who? Allah Himself. To focus on the giver of light, to focus on the giver of mercy, to focus on the one who relieves all distress in those moments. And that is a form of beauty. That's number one. Keeping your focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, and this is something that I think a lot of us make a mistake sometimes when we're thinking about the collective, the community, and the plans that we make for goodness in this life and the things we hope to do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of times we get obsessed with the results of our own efforts. We get obsessed with seeing goodness come to be in our own lives. SubhanAllah, if you look at the ayah that I recited, am hasibatum an tadkhul al-jannah, do you think you'll enter into paradise? Allah answers with what? all of the hardships of this world and people seeking relief in this world, not with the reasons by which a person enters into Jannah. Because the focus should be on Jannah the entire time. The focus should be on the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the success of your results. The focus should be on the reward of Allah, not the success of your results. And a lot of times we mix up the two. We get so focused on seeing victory, seeing our efforts come to fruition, that we forget that at the end of the day, Allah is the one who's going to bless or deprive. Allah will give on His time. And what I need to be focused on is the sincerity of my intention and the pursuit of His reward. And that's not going to translate into a lack of effort. In fact, it will give me resilience of my efforts of good because I trust that the efforts are never really in my hands. And so I put and I put and I put into those efforts, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give fruit to this effort after I pass away. It might not come to fruition in my lifetime. How many people inspired the world but never got to live to see the inspiration that they put into this world? Can you imagine Khadija radiallahu anha? never lived to see the legislation of Salah. 
Imagine if the Prophet ﷺ could have come down from Isra and Mi'raj and went to Khadija radiallahu anha and told Khadija about what happened in Isra and Mi'raj. Khadija did not get to make hijrah. She died in Mecca before all of that. A woman of perfect iman never lived to see Siyam Ramadan. It's incredible. She didn't see it. All of this was foreign to her because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took her before all of that even happened. But it's there. Think about the Anbiya of Allah, the Prophets of Allah. In one narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned 124,000 Prophets. 124,000 Prophets. Some of those Prophets we know, and we know about the hard time that they had. Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam averaged less than a convert per decade. Think about that. The, if you take the entirety of Nuh Islam's followers and you spread them out over 950 years, 80 followers in one narration, over 950 years, that means it's less than a convert per decade. And along the way, lots of mockery and humiliation. And look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes of Nuh salam, The first messenger of Allah that will be called on the day of judgment and the ummah of Muhammad salam, steps in to testify on his behalf. The first messenger of Allah called on the Day of Judgment is Nuh alayhi salam and the entire Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi reciting Surah, Surah Nuh <laughs> steps in and says that this Prophet did his job. We are a testimony to the job of Nuh alayhi salam to his people. He did his job. Imagine Nuh alayhi salam seeing this entire Ummah of people standing on his behalf in the courtroom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nuh alayhi salam did his job. And there are prophets, you know, the Prophet ﷺ described the Anbiya of Allah like a house. He is the last brick, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are prophets who left this earth with one follower. Prophets who left this earth with no followers. A Nabi of Allah, a Prophet of Allah with his miracles, and not a single person to accept his message but he's still part of the house. And that's the point. Allah decides how to build the house, not you. You do as you're told, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring something out of it, even if it is in ways that you cannot comprehend or understand. And so focus on his reward, not your result. Focus on his reward, not your result. Many great people walk this earth and put seeds in it, and even those that were growing did not recognize who planted the initial seeds. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, سَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ Allah will document every footstep. Allah will document every deed put forward. Allah will document the legacies. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate accordingly. It's there, but focus on His reward, not your results. You have to let that go. The next thing is to focus on the planner, not your plan. Sometimes you plan and Allah plans. And sometimes your plans don't work out. As long as you are sincere in your intention and doing your best, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make something out of it. It goes back to a very personal level where Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu talked about dua. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah will answer the dua of a person until they say what? Allah will answer your dua until you say what? Anyone know? Da'utu falam yustajabli. I made dua and Allah did not answer me. That's when it's closed. Allah will answer your duas until you shut the door of your own dua. Yes, he'll answer it in ways sometimes that you can't understand, but he will keep on answering your dua. If you make a hundred duas for the same thing and you can't, you have not seen the result of a single one of them. Allah has answered all 100 of them in ways that you cannot understand. Until you say, Lam yustajabli. I made dua and Allah did not answer me. Then you take out the ability or the efficacy of your own dua by your questioning the one who you're making dua to. Don't question the planner. Don't question the designer. Allah knows what he's doing. And so you make dua. And the last thing, dear brothers and sisters, 
the ability of the Prophet ﷺ to see good in the hardest of times. Sometimes there are things that are happening around us that are good omens for us to, to say Alhamdulillah for. How many of you have heard of Imam Siraj Wahaj? Can you see it? Show of hands. Alhamdulillah. All right. Imam Siraj is uh, an amazing human being, an Imam in the United States, really a, a pioneer, has done much work. May Allah preserve him and bless him and accept from him. And I remember uh, being at a fundraiser with him recently. You know, our generation of Muslims, we're down on everything. We talk about how bad the community is, we talk about how no one's doing anything right, all organizations are failing, all the shiuch are corrupt. Everyone is horrible. And at the end of the day, you know what that gives us? It gives us an excuse to not do anything. An excuse for my idleness is to question every good effort. Cast doubt on every good effort and say it's all for nothing and these people are all fake and everyone is this and everyone is that. And what does that do? It gives me a sense of complacency and a sense of, of, of meaning and purpose because I'm the only one tweeting. I'm the one that's doing all the, you know, I'm setting the record straight. So you do your jihad on your keyboard and everybody else's mujahada is for batil, is for falsehood. But your jihad on your keyboard, mashallah, right? We have, we have this, 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 a bit, this tendency to just keep on, you know, just throwing negative uh, things towards everything, right? And sometimes it's a lot less nefarious than that. I mean, sometimes it's pessimistic about everything. Someone starts something good and you say, this is gonna fail. No way they'll be able to overcome this. And subhanAllah, there are naysayers in every situation, even in the Qur'an. Like think about it, if you were with the people of Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam gets to the water. Think about the pressure on Musa alayhi salam. He's got his whole ummah with him, Bani Israel. The most ruthless army in the world is right behind him, on his tail. The people looking at Musa alayhi salam. Like, what are you gonna do now? We're dead. Right? We've seen Fir'aun cut people into pieces over and over and over again. We're done. Right? And what did they say? They start to blame him. Inna mudrakun. They caught us. Where is your God now? What's going to happen now? Like, like he needed that at that moment. Right? He didn't need that at that moment. And of course, there were some believers amongst Bani Israel that might have been shook by those words. But what did Allah give him? Allah gave him the staff split the seas for him. The naysayers, they rode along, <laughs> they took the opening, but the reward was only assured for those who had certainty throughout. The dunyawi opening, the worldly opening, everyone benefited from. You know, it's a, the, the term is bandwagoning in, in, in America at least, right? They jumped on the bandwagon. At that point when the success is happening, everybody can ride along. But there were some that were walking through the seas and saying, MashaAllah, probably patting Musa Islam on the back and saying, good job, we never doubted you. That a minute ago we're saying what? We're done. Can't you see what's happening now? But now, MashaAllah, in Khandaq, in Khandaq with the Prophet Sallallahu and the believers that were digging the ditch, there were some that were you know, not really digging. Right? Some of them, were munafiqun, they were hypocrites. They were pretending to be amongst them. And they weren't really digging. You had some that were digging, mashallah, right? There's a difference in the digging. Now, if you, if you walked up to them in those moments, you'd see them all, you know, with something in their hands. The Prophet Sallallahu dug by himself, by the way, more than what 10 people would dig. It's one of my proudest moments of the Prophet Sallallahu It's when Bara radiallahu anhu describes it. He said, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu rise up from the ditch and the Prophet ﷺ, every part of his skin was covered in mud. What a beautiful Prophet, alayhi salatu What a leader, right? What a Sayyid to his qawm. What a leader of his people. He was in the trenches, literally, to where not a single part of his blessed skin showed, sallallahu from the amount of work that he was doing. And the Ansar and the Muhajireen are singing these songs. Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al akhirah. And the Prophet ﷺ looks at them and says, Oh Allah, there is no life except for the life of the hereafter. Fakhfir lil ansar wal muhajira. So forgive the ansar and the muhajira, these young people that gave it all in. But you know what? You know what those hypocrites were saying? 
said, مَا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا Allah and His Prophet have not promised us except delusion. We're done. Why are you people happy? Why are you singing these songs of motivation? Why are you making dua? Why are you digging so hard? We already know they're going to find a way to massacre us. We're never going to build this trench in time. But you better believe that after the success of the Khandaq, some of those people came forth and were high-fiving each other, right? We did it. You didn't do anything. You rode along at the end and then you waited for the next moment so that you could show your hypocrisy. But everyone rode at the time of success. The Prophet Sallallahu in Hudaybiyyah, SubhanAllah, like, it's one of my favorite moments because it's like those subtle things about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. About how he always saw good, always saw good. Suhail ibn Amr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. By the way, Suhail is one of my favorite companions because his story is an exception to the majority of the tulaqa, those who became Muslim last. He really, he, he really has an almost strange phenomenon. If any of you watched the first, watched the lecture that we did about Suhail radiallahu ta'ala anhu, very interesting person. I mean, two decades of oppressing the Prophet sallallahu But then when he became Muslim, he, he resembled the muhajireen. Interesting person radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Then died as a shaheed radiallahu anhu. But in Hudaybiyyah, it's the last person you want to see. When the Prophet saw Suhail, the meaning of the word Suhail is ease. Rasulullah Sallallahu smiled and he said, Sahula, our affair has become easy. Allah sent us Suhail, therefore things are going to be Sahil. Like he even saw good alayhi salatu wasalam, in the name of the chief negotiator. That there is something to be happy about, that Allah is sending us signs of goodness to come. As he sends to us Suhail radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That's special. That's the eye of prophetic optimism. To see hope and to expand it. To see hope and to expand it in difficult times. I think I, I forgot to tell you the Imam Siraj story, didn't I? I just realized that. I went from Imam Siraj and then I started talking about Bani Israel and I forgot about Imam Siraj. Imam Siraj, I was, I was, I was sitting with him and he literally, he, I was sitting next to him, he tapped me on the table. He said, Omar, I never thought in my lifetime I'd see banners about Islam on the subway system and thousands of masajids in America. Because he lived in a time in America where they had less than 100 masjids and the public knew very little of Islam and he was just bragging about where Islam has come. And subhanAllah, I remember right before he said that to me, I was thinking about something negative about the state of our community. And he's just so optimistic, so happy. And I'm like, what a man. What a beautiful eye to have. The Prophet Sallallahu had that prophetic eye. And when we think about good, you know, seeing goodness, even in the midst of a very hard time, seeing light, even in the midst of darkness. قَالَ عَلَيْهِ والسلام, مَنْ قَالَ هَلَكَ النَّاسِ فَهُوَ أَهْلَكُهُمْ Those who say the people have no hope in them is the most hopeless of them all. Ahlakahum is the most hopeless of them all. Ahlakuhum is the one who's making them all hopeless. You know when the naysayer in the group deflates everybody? Don't be that person. Don't be that person. Something good is happening and immediately you point out the flaws of it. Don't be that person. You see something or someone imperfect, see the good and make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expand it. Don't put it down. Don't put it down. Because pessimists make pessimists. They deflate dreams. And they stop great people from being great sometimes. Or they stop people from following great people. Right? Because they get in the way with very convenient barriers of negativity. If you're a pessimist, most of the time you're going to be right. <laughs> most of the time you're going to be right. You know, it's really nice to see I told you so. I knew right away that thing was going to fail. I knew this was going to happen. Good for you. Now what good are you doing? Nothing. Next person that tries to do good, oh, it's this, 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 this is why it's going to fail. Then when it fails, mashallah, you're able to offer your commentary and portray yourself as a wise man or a wise woman. You're not wise. You're just really, really unpleasant to be around. <laughs> That's not wisdom. That's not hikmah to be able to see error and to bring it down or to be able to predict failure because most efforts will fail. Proportionally speaking, most of the time, efforts are not going to materialize. 
But Allah teaches us why. وَلَئِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you are grateful, I will increase you. That equation is true for everything, including light in the time of darkness. In your personal life, when you have a million reasons to complain, but one reason to be grateful, and you say, Alhamdulillah, for the one reason, Allah will increase it. And put into perspective the million reasons to complain. And in regards to our da'wah and our efforts and the things that Bidnillahi ta'ala, we hope to do for his sake, so long as we hope to do it for his sake. We say, Alhamdulillah, look where it's come. There was a time where this gathering was not possible. Alhamdulillah for this gathering. Alhamdulillah for the ability to know one another through La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Alhamdulillah for the da'wah of Al Islam being so alive and thriving despite all of the forces that try to do what? Yuriduna liyutufi'u nur Allahi bi afwahihim. They wish to extinguish the light of Allah with their mouths. They can grow their media outlets. They can get more exquisite and specific in their arguments against Islam. They can get better at skewing and misinterpreting and decontextualizing. They can get more advanced in messing with your minds, with the imagery that they are able to use. They wish to extinguish the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But who's going to preserve Allah's light? It's not you and I. Wallahu mutim munurihi. Allah will preserve His light. Allah will preserve His light, even if they hate it. Allah will preserve His light. We just hope that Allah will let us carry those torches. We don't light the torches. We don't make the light happen. We just say, Alhamdulillah, when Allah gives us one. Allah gave me a candle. Allah gave me a light. Alhamdulillah for that. Let Allah expand that light. We know that the design of the designer will come to be. Here's the, the blessing of where we're at. This ummah will never die. Islam will not be extinguished. The Muslims will not be wiped out. The end of times is victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At no point should we ever feel like Allah has lost control of this affair. It's never happened and it never will happen. Allah is in control during the time of the Crusades and Allah is in control during the most glorious days of Islam. Allah is in control in Mecca. Allah is in control in Medina. Allah is in control in Habasha. Allah was in control in the year 610. Allah was in control in 623 when it looked entirely different. Allah did not lose a grip of things at any point. But as believers, just remember these two things. Focus on his reward, not your result. Focus on his reward, not your result. Focus on the planner, not your plans. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to always see the light in darkness. May Allah allow us to be the light in darkness. May Allah forgive us for our shortcomings. May Allah forgive us when we question him. May Allah forgive us when we are insincere to him. May Allah direct all of our efforts to be sincere for him, all of our longing to be towards him. And may Allah make us amongst those who make our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam proud. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us amongst those that make our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam proud. Ya Allah, allow this gathering to be one that is pleasing to you. Let all of us who came be forgiven, let the sins be departed from us and write us amongst those who you are pleased with. We ask you, O oh Allah, to open up the doors for us in our personal lives and in our community lives. We ask you, O oh Allah, to lift the hardship from your ummah. We ask you, O oh Allah, to put barakah in our efforts to please you. And we ask you, O oh Allah, that all of it materializes in your reward of Jannat al firdaus and the companionship of our beloved Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Are you tired of all these annoying ads on YouTube? 
Are you worried that a haram video might pop up? Well, the One Islam TV app is here to solve these problems, inshallah. The One Islam TV app is 100% free of any ads and is safe to browse for your peace of mind. Watch or listen to lectures and lessons while you work, rest or drive with your device switched off. Watch videos on demand or download videos and watch offline. Watch hundreds of high quality produced Islamic reminders, Quran learning videos, stories of the prophets and so much more. Two to four new videos uploaded daily, inshallah. One Islam TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means a small amount you pay for your subscription is a sadaqa jariya, continuous charity for you as we use the funds raised to continue producing more beneficial videos and reminders, inshallah. The One Islam TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. So you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 7-day trial. May Allah reward you for supporting our work. Ooh.